Hi there, you're listening to the Practical Stoic Podcast with your host, me, Simon Drew. If you'd like to listen to over 200 episodes that were recorded before 2020, then you can head to my Patreon site. It's patreon.com forward slash Simon J. E. Drew. We'd love to have you there and any support is greatly appreciated. We'd love to also have you on our Facebook community, The Practical Stoic Mastermind. But for now, enjoy the show. Hi there, my name's Simon Drew and welcome to The Practical Stoic Podcast. Now, you all know the guest that we have on today, none other than our good friend Kai Whiting. He's always so happy to come on the show, so generous with his time. And uh, really glad that we got to have this conversation today where we kind of uh, were working around this idea of the Stoic Sage. Uh, So really interesting conversation there. But for those of you who don't know, Kai is actually a researcher and lecturer in sustainability and Stoicism based at the Catholic University of Louvain uh, in Belgium. Uh, And he tweets at Kai Whiting and he also blogs over at StoicKai.com. So make sure you head to the links in the show notes. Show him some love. Let him know how much you appreciate him coming on the show. He's so active in the Stoic community uh, and he's talking to everybody. It's awesome. So we love to have him here. And uh, without any further ado, I present to you my interview with Kai Whiting. Now, welcome. And I want to ask you from the start, you're writing a book. Can you tell us about it? I am writing a book. Uh, the first thing I will say is it's not an academic book. It is, okay. it is a self-help book with a twist uh, in the sense of how can we use self-help, self-help to help ourselves and then transform society, or at least the community around us. So it's a, it starts off, every chapter so far starts off with a quote, and then I tell the story with the co-author, Leonidas Constantikos, who's at the University, uh, International University of Florida, Mm-hmm. And we take this quote and we tell the person's story. So like, for example, if I started with a quote from you, mm-hmm. I would then go on and tell your story. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not going to say much more about it, but I would tell your story and then I would then apply it to a very specific sort of contemporary context so that you kind of go, okay, this is Simon's story. This is why this is relevant, but what does it mean to me? Mm-hmm. So it's like, okay, Simon's story is interesting. What does Simon teach me? What does that mean? And then like a reflection. So more or less every single chapter does that. So mm. it takes your quote, tells a little bit about your story in reference to the quote that we're unpacking, and then really doubles down on what that means. Um, mm. But it's more of a reflective means because in, in stoicism, it's not about we should do this, we ought to do this, or we ought to do that other than be virtuous. So it's yeah. not really telling you how to live your life because that would not be stoic at all. Yeah. But just to kind of like encompass the idea that it's an art of living. It's like mm. breathing, walking, thinking, virtue. And then what yeah. that means to you according to who you are. So if you're Australian, if you're male, if you're married, if you're a mm. father, the kind of job you have, the clientele that you have. So it would really sort of ask you in your capacity or your various capacities, your various roles, particularly mm. in modern society, what is it that you are called to do? for the environment or economically what can you do about sort of inequalities if they're in if they're in a situation of injustice because not all inequality is unjust right but let's Mm. say we find an unjust situation what are you called to do what are you called to do as a parent or a husband or a wife or whoever that person happens to be so that's Mm. kind of like the book uh because i just felt that there was a lot um there is a lot more coming out on stoicism and self-help and that's not really my, that's not really what I know a lot about in the sense that I mm. typically, as, as some of your listeners would be aware, um, apply stoicism to more sort of collective issues. Some people mm. would call it social action issues. I prefer more like collective issues, issues that do affect us profoundly, but don't only rely on ourselves because I don't think I can be you know, of like Donald Robertson's intelligence on the personal cognitive behavioral therapy. It's not my... It's not my um, training. It's not my understanding of the world. So I leave all the hard stuff like that up to him and sort of just come into, okay, once you've, say, read Massimo's Pelugi's How to Be a Stoic and you've read various books from Donald and, say, other authors, John Sellers, what, what happens if you want to then use stoicism to think about the wider world around you? Mm. That's kind of like what the book does. 
Yeah, I like that. And and it all comes back. So I, I like that you've kind of broken it down or you will be breaking it down into kind of like that individual. You you, you help yourself first beca- become strong, essentially, right? Like become a stronger human yeah. being, a more virtuous human being. And then once you're at that point, it's kind of like then you can pivot into finding ways that you in your own personal life and your own roles that you have as a human being then you can look at how you can influence society through those roles and those those particular means that exactly. you have, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I like it. Me, that is personal the... development with a, with a twist. I mm-hmm. like it. With a twist. For me, though, you're a good example of somebody who's living that, right? And people well, might not think that. that. Well, definitely. I mean, you could have just took the Stoke stuff, run with it, and kept it to yourself, right? But the podcast, I mean, although you can't, you know, we have no control over the listeners, thankfully, that would be mm-hmm. terrible, but we have, we can, we have a circle of straight influence and you have certainly used your stoic understanding and your knowledge in some areas much greater than my own to impact others. And that's what I'm saying. Like, we're not, I'm not saying like, okay, everything that's beyond your control, make a difference. No, like mm-hmm. if you are capable of, of running a podcast, which I am certainly not capable of doing but if you are capable of doing that then maybe that's something you think you can you can use to contribute to society why not and that's perfectly within your control to run a podcast if that is your skill set so i will say for example i do a bit of tongue-in-cheek against say environmental activism because i think Mm. that being an activist depends very much on your personality Mm. so you may be called to be an environmental activist but I certainly am not. It doesn't mean that yeah. that role is invalid, but I don't like shouting and I don't like being in public circles in amongst angry people. Yeah. So I think yeah. that the writing in a quiet space is more in line with my own nature. So my call yeah. to live according to nature isn't just the nature around us, but our own nature. So if I was standing up and getting cross, you know, or assertive not cross because it wouldn't be stoked to be cross but assertive in a public setting in that way i would be going against my own nature so it's not asking you to be an activist quote unquote it's saying what is it that you can do to make the biggest impact so i just said i would be terrible at podcasts why because i fundamentally cannot edit videos so so or, or audio and that's really critical in a podcast it's something that goes unsaid but if you didn't do your editing job everyone else would know about it so yeah. that's the kind of thing that I'm asking people to, to reflect on. Listen, Kai, I just want to say, you might think I'm aligning with my nature here, but you should check out my YouTube videos. That is against my nature right now. I'm telling you that. <laughs> like, I am, I am trying as hard as I can to make them somewhat watchable, uh, and I can guarantee I'll get better over time. But I tell you what, there are some... It, it, it's funny because, you know, I... Okay, this is not me saying that I am aligning with the true stoic within me by doing this. But, you know, I had this kind of conversation with with somebody recently. They were saying that they were starting a podcast and they were asking for some advice. And I kind of told them exactly what you're kind of saying there. It's like, listen, don't start a podcast because you think that that's the thing to do or that that's going to get you the... Like you might... if, If you are far better at writing than you are at recording audio, you will touch more people's lives through your writing than through doing a podcast that you're bad at and that that sounds bad and that you just you hate doing right like people can tell when you really love to do something and often you loving to do something means that you're really aligned with your nature as a human being it's like like you know you you with your academia like we know that that's what you love to do right you love to go deeper into things and and um, with your your um, you know your work on sustainability um, and and activism as you say like like you love and that's what you're doing right um, and so people have really got to um, question like before they do something is this something that is genuinely aligned with my nature as a human being or am I just doing this because the crowd is doing it right and exactly. you know the reason why I did the podcast was literally because I said well. I tend to be charismatic. I tend to be a performer. I love being on stage. Uh, you know, I tend to, uh, you know, be pretty good with audio. I've got the recording equipment anyway. Um, and I know how to do it. So why, why not? Right. So it was kind of like that for me. It was like, well, why not? Like if nobody else is going to do it. 
Um, but this might actually, and this is a terrible place for me to segue into the sage because it seems like I'm calling myself the sage, um, but I'm not. <laughs> um, but this is this is actually an important aspect of the sage, right? Like a, a person who has completely integrated themselves into nature and aligned with with nature on exactly. on almost every aspect. But for the people at home who have absolutely no idea what we would talk about when we say the Stoic sage, can you give us a, 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 as brief or elaborate a definition as you can of what the Stoic Sage is and maybe why it's important. Of course, uh, for, I would say that the Stoic Sage is the yardstick. So a lot of people would have a "What would Jesus do?" like mm. bracelet or like something they would look at frequently. I would love to have "What would the Sage do?" Yeah, uh, because it's it's the ideal, right? It's yeah. the ideal, the person who has who has sufficiently gone through life in a very practical way, so they no longer commit a moral mistake. That doesn't mm -hmm. mean they're all known, because they can't know everything. But they yeah. might know, for example, I don't know anything about the environment, so I'll go and speak to Kai, because I know that Kai mm -hmm. knows something about the environment, and I trust his judgment. So that's them using their yeah. wisdom to go and find out of knowledge, for example. But if I'm talking about podcasts, I'm not gonna go to Kai, because he doesn't know anything, so I'll go mm -hmm. to Simon. So it's somebody who's not all knowing. Let me just get that straight. They are not all knowing. Yeah. They are incapable of making a moral mistake or a moral um, misjudgment. So they could misjudge something they don't know about, but that would be unusual because they'd find somebody that would. Yeah. But they wouldn't make a moral mistake. So they wouldn't categorize something as, oh, that's terrible. That's really bad. For example, it's raining. That's bad. Mm. No, it's just raining. Like a sage would never say that rain is bad. Yeah. And it's terrible that weather man or the weather woman says, oh, we have sun today. How wonderful. It's just sun or just yeah. rain, right? So the sage would be very practical and go, it's just raining. It's just mm -hmm. raining really hard. <laughs> like, yeah. Why is that bad? Yeah. Why is that, under what circumstances that bad? So that's the kind of question that the sage would ask. So in other the words, sage the sage has somewhat of like a, um, a perfect understanding of good, bad, and indifferent, right? Like he, he just that, exactly. that perfect exactly. understanding of what really affects us as human beings, what doesn't affect us right. and what, you know, could be good or bad, depending on how you look at it. Right. Exactly. So they would understand like in this circumstance, this would be good or this mm. would be bad. So let's take the uh, recent bushfires. Rain at that point would have been really good, right? But that yeah. would be qualified by the sage. They would mm. qualify it. Say so yeah. it will be good because, and this will result in you know uh, maybe less problems with injustice because insurance companies don't want to pay out because mm. they call it an act of God, right? Yeah. But that would always be a qualified statement, and it would be very clear as to where they draw that line, mm. right? So people think, okay, so he's he or she is not all right. No, they're not. Right. So they're perfect. So they're sinless. Well, you have to remember in stories and there is no sin. Mm. Right, the sin as such is to be a vicious person, mm. so to act cowardly, yeah, the opposite of vice, unjustly. exactly. Uh, sorry, yeah. the opposite of virtue, so opposite yes. of virtue, yeah. yes, to be greedy. So, so that's the sin, as, as it were. So, it's they are a sinless person if we take it only if we take mm. sin to mean vice. So, yeah. if you want to say use the word sin because that aligns with like your religious tendencies or your inclinations, that's fine as long as we are both aware that vice to me is sin. So if I'm being sinful as a stoic, it would be because I'm acting or thinking viciously. Mm. Yeah. So the sage is an ideal, as, as you've probably said on this podcast, and I think I've heard you say it. It's, it's an ideal that's as rare as like the phoenix in actuality. Mm. So people yeah. say, okay, has the sage ever existed? Now, I can't say yes or no. And that's, mm -hmm. to me, not even relevant. To me, it's completely irrelevant if the sage existed or not, because I use the sage as a yardstick. I ask yeah. myself, not how do I become a better version of Kai? That's not the question I ask myself. Mm. I say, how can I be the best Kai I can be according to the sage? Yeah. Right? Because becoming a better version of myself, if I have a false impression, so if I misunderstand my nature and I think I should be a podcaster, then I think becoming a better version of myself is becoming more popular in my podcast, right? Yeah. I laugh because I am that bad on podcasts. It would be funny for me to do that. <laughs> Let's say I, I had a conviction that I really believed that I should be a podcaster. Then becoming a better version of myself, according to my own criteria, would lead me down the wrong garden path. That doesn't mean that it's a bad path in the sense that it's not necessarily vicious, 
Although I would argue that wouldn't be very wise, right? Yeah. So I would I would argue it would be, but I'm you know who knows. So it's something that you just you have to sit and think. It's not just about being the best version of Simon or Kai or Jane or or Paul or Pauline. It's really like how can I be the best version of myself according to a higher set of standards, mm. and these standards are not arbitrary like okay for well because some god or seneca said so or mm. epitizer said so which is why i'm very against just using quotes because somebody said so yeah right we have to the stage would say yes epitizer said this why did he say this and what was the context in which he said it and mm. it's the context that i'm currently sitting in something that can be aligned to the, the the context that epititis was sitting in so if he's talking about human nature yes of course if he's talking about maybe more cultural things i'm saying this rufus about should i cut my beard and to what extent is that having a beard useful right so he makes yeah. the argument which is why part of the reason i have this beard that we should have things that are useful so i don't mm. uh, have a mustache because i find that it gets in the way right? yeah but that doesn't mean that you should have a beard because Bersonius Rufus th thinks that having a beard is, is very helpful when you're cutting away something that might be useful. Because you say, OK, well, mm. well, what context was he in? Like, I mean, he probably didn't have central heating. I, I imagine that's probably quite true unless he had a, you know, a, you know the only form of central heating you would have <laughs> would be a fire. Right? Yeah. So having a beard, I would say, would be pretty useful. Also, shaving would be much more dangerous. Yeah. If he cut himself, he would be infected. It would be much more difficult, especially as he was exiled, yeah, to, to yeah. you know get medical aid, right? Yeah. So I would say in his case, growing a beard is a very sensible thing to do, and just to remove what is unnecessary because cutting oneself could become a massive unnecessary problem. Hmm. So that's what I believe. My son says that. Why do I think he says about being vegetarian and eating locally? He he would understand the food. If you transport food, there is a massive problem of hygiene back in the day. There's no mm. refrigeration, right? So it makes no sense whatsoever because you have this sort of pompous understanding of your own self to mm. say, I want food from 200 miles away or 200 kilometers away. Mm. Why would you do that? It would not be particularly safe. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So there is real common sense here. And I would argue that you yourself would also think the same if you had to rely on just boats, for example, to get food to Australia. You say, well, yeah, I want, I will eat something that's been on the boat for six months. Yeah, that's a really good idea. If there's no refrigeration. Yeah. Or I will just eat salted fish because I know that that is good for me. Yeah. So that's why I think that he was very fundamental about eating certain things is, is bad. Because I would say, under his understanding of the world, yeah. and, and what was necessary for him, what was wise, was to eat locally. It's still wise for very, for very different reasons. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. It's not hygienic reasons. Then eating else, you know, otherwise would be vicious. Now we can, deep, you know, uh, dig deeper into that. I don't think it's necessary for this this podcast. But you see what I mean? Like, there's context it, there. Yeah. So I, I, what I'm getting from what you're saying is that the sage is essentially uh, the most virtuous possible human being uh, within the current context of what we know. Uh, to be yes. fact and and the the society that we live in um, and and I put what we know to be fact before the society because often society norms are not necessarily the like the truth right, right. it's like it's like right. that's yeah, exactly. the mob mentality um, but yes. but they they put you know truth first knowledge they get their knowledge from the experts and and yeah. that's another that's another great topic that we can kind of go down in the future as well um, but how did i guess my question is so for example in christianity i know this is a religion so i'm not i'm not saying that stoicism is a religion guys i'm not starting a cult here but but what i like in, <laughs> in christianity here and I, and by saying that i was not calling christianity a cult necessarily as well so <laughs> please settle down if you're christian there um so what i was going to say is for, for the christians they have jesus christ that's essentially their version of the sage right it's like it's like everybody within Christianity looks to Jesus Christ as the ultimate right. best possible human being. And they have things like the Sermon on the Mount, or, you know, they could even yes. look at like Moses, the 10 commandments. Like they have very clear guidelines of this is what's right. This yeah. is what's wrong. This is how you live your life. And so when we talk about the sage, I get it right up to the point where it's like, okay, you have to decide what principles 
you live by mm. in order to become the sage. Not that we can become the sage, but but um, but we can in that, theory, but in practice, it would be yeah, very yeah. It's it's that's that's what I mean. But there seems to be guidelines in in other sort of philosophies or religions. Like what what are the guidelines that we have for for essentially attaining sagehood? Or, or I guess the best question would be, how do we decide? what is virtuous and what is not how do we get to that point where we can understand that right okay. i'll just backtrack why for example is it important to understand the, the context context in terms of time right mm. people would say people would say well why how can say let's say aristotle be a sage because he was quite negative towards women right mm. so let's say we took that and say well okay at his period of time was mm. he acting on fact i don't think he was in that case right but let's say he was was he acting on facts as far as he understood them right because he can't be all night then yes it's quite possible that he could have been a sage right mm -hmm. i wouldn't say that's what it was but i think it's a very good example or cato cato can be quite unreasonable at times mm -hmm. but he is called a close to the stoic sage and i certainly think cato is mm -hmm. closer than aristotle for the cosmopolitan message that stoicism has that aristotle doesn't really and yet he still makes these mistakes that we can see are glaring because we are seeing it in hindsight. Mm. Yeah. So it's like, you know, we're not, we're not judging every single, oh, for example, Marcus Aurelius, if he were to say, yeah, but he didn't abolish slavery. No, he didn't. He mm. did not abolish slavery. Does that mean he wasn't a sage? Mm. It's difficult to say. I don't think you have to look at that, that, that context. So yeah. going back to the question that's a lot harder to answer mm. is the guidelines. So yes, I would say even in Islam is actually much easier because you follow the hadith which are the collection of the sayings attributed yeah. to the prophet um, Muhammad and you would say peace be upon him so you would have this beard as well as a muslim beard because that's the beard that Muhammad had mm. why don't we have that set of guidelines as such in stories that's probably a better because, question yeah yeah why don't we have them because otherwise we're going to go down the rabbit hole of what is truth in terms of, of god right yeah so why don't we have them i would argue quite strongly because it depends on your role right so mm -hmm. muhammad's role as a prophet was a prophet so according to his role in his context you could argue a case he was a sage right you could argue whether we want to say he was or wasn't is, is irrelevant but you could argue according to his context and his social role as a military you know, as a military, social, and uh, national leader, mm. that was his role. Did he do his role well? Now, Jesus is a different example. If we take the Jesus of Christianity, not Islam, because in Islam he is a prophet. In fact, mm. he's the only prophet that doesn't sin at all in yeah. the Quran. But let's take the Christian one. He is he he's different because he is um, the Son of God or mm. God incarnate. So he's he's got a, he's operating on an entirely different plane. Let's assume that Jesus is is true. He's not just a historical figure. He's actually the Son of God. He's operating on a different plane. He's calling you to a higher level that you cannot yourself achieve because you cannot become God. Mm. The sage is something that because you can achieve sagehood if you are willing to obtain the practical knowledge, so what you said before, about the ability to know what to do, how to do it, when to do it, with whom. Mm. If you're willing to put in that practice, if you're willing to be temperate, if you're willing to basically open your ears and, and find out who the, you know, who the people who are knowledgeable around you, then you, are, you could be a sage. You could never be Jesus. Mm. You can never be Jesus. Right? So the guidelines are different because they're coming from a sort of, let's say a godlike figure or God. Mm. Right. Yeah. The sage does not claim to be God. What the sage would claim, if anything at all, because actually sages don't need to claim. If you need to claim you're a sage, you're not a sage, right? Mm. Because yeah. you don't. You, you you should be so comfortable in your position as a sage, sage that you, as your reputation is beyond your control, mm. claiming something about your reputation is is a is a paradox. It makes no sense. Like, why would I claim I'm a sage if my reputation is beyond my control? Yeah. Right. Because yeah. you may think I'm not a sage. So at yeah. which point do I become a sage? I believe I'm a sage. When you believe, as a sage, I'm not bothered about that. Yeah. It doesn't matter what you think, right? So I don't. Well, it's kind of like you know how how most geniuses of history have come to the point where they realize that the more they knew, the less they knew, right? It's like that ultimate humility. Yeah. Like if you're going around yeah. telling everybody, "Hey, I'm a sage," like do you know, like like yeah. 
<laughs> exactly. <laughs> Everybody gets it's, that you're not a saint, claim, you know. And if you just go around pretending like you know absolutely everything, then everybody knows that. Oh, yeah, he might he might not have caught on yet. You know, like there's a lot to know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So it's, I mean, Jesus in the Bible certainly make, makes certain claims, right? That those claims are just not made by the sage. The, sa the only claim, if they were to make it, was that they are living according, I would believe that they would say, I am living according to nature. Mm. And then they would explain their own nature and they would explain the environmental facts and the facts of the world that they are able to understand mm. and which they are able to obtain through their their, their, their network. But they'd be very careful with that because they say that sages wouldn't necessarily have many friends because basically they don't need them as such. They, because especially if their friends are, say, the ones that are ignorant, right? They say, well, why would a sage have ignorant friends? Now, that's a very strong sort of uh, line that strikes with Tegel. I don't think it's necessarily helpful, but that's what Zeno says, that only the sages can be friends. Like everybody else mm. is kind of like the ignorant masses. But then they say, okay, so the sages would lord over these people. They would rule over them. No. Why would it, the sage wouldn't need to do that? The sage says, well, why do I rule over these people? I don't, I don't feel the need to do that. I don't need to, to shout my credentials. Mm. The ruling over someone's an indifference. So it's a very sort of uh, metaphorical, I feel it more metaphorically useful than really digging deep into Zeno's Republic to understand exactly, and we've only got fragments of it anyway, to extend the exact nature of the sage. My personal guidance are, um, am I being just today? Am mm. I being reasonable? So I had a really good example to give you. Uh, I don't know if you're aware, but on the Facebook group, I, my work was personally attacked. Right? Yeah. And the person meant extremely well. well. Actually, we agree. The funny mm. thing is we actually agree because we agree that environmentalism and stoicism is not the same thing. Yeah. Right? But the way that it was said was like, okay, Kai, you, I, you know, you've done this thing. You're dragging the environment into stoicism. This is completely wrong and got really, really annoyed about it. Yeah. So I decided to take a day. I took 24 hours to respond because I mm. thought if I respond any sooner, I will be angry. Yeah. And if I'm angry, I will be unjust. And I'd just mm. written a piece like how to be stoic on social media. And so I had yeah. to sit and read my own advice and go, let me weigh this up. How do I be stoic on social media? And it was kind of like, okay, I, 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 asked myself, am I directly involved? Well, I was. <laughs> I yeah. was directly involved. It was like my name was in it. There was a picture of me in it. It was like, you know, like, you know, it's Kai's for everything's terrible. Don't like, you hate you it when you just rest. write an article about how to be good on social <laughs> exactly. media and then somebody attacks exactly. you? That's the yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's I was the... like, <laughs> yeah. And I literally written it the week before, like, for like posted the week before, and I was told that I had hijacked stoicism, which was very, you know, could have been very painful if I hadn't took those 24 hours because yeah. to say that I'd hijacked stoicism would, would just be against everything I stand for as yeah. a human being. But I just decided not to act for 24 hours. I, I read the comments, I sat and pondered, I let the dust settle. And, I did uh, notice you know, that because I saw that comment and I saw that you didn't you didn't reply immediately. I was, I was like, where's Kai? <laughs> What's going on? But go on. Uh, yeah. But that was why I was like, because if I am angry, if I respond in a negative way, I do many things. One, I don't do anything for my reputation, which is mm. beyond my control anyway, but I don't enhance it by my own actions. Mm. Two, we actually agree. <laughs> like, yeah. And I had to sort of fathom out where do we agree and why do we agree and where is the misunderstanding? Three, I could have set off an atomic bomb because it would have just become this vitriol, vitriolic abusive system and I, I didn't want that because I just mm. didn't see that the sage would do that yeah. I think the sage I mean the sage the way I see the sage is the most harmonious person on the planet mm. they're in complete harmony with themselves they know for example that they need to let the dust settle for at least 24 hours or maybe they need it for an hour I don't know that maybe yeah. they're probably far more accelerated than I am they know exactly what is needed to be done in their community they're complete and you know it's just it's very nice dynamic. I would say they're like almost like a river flowing through and understanding, mm. not particularly affected by the land, but affecting the land. Mm -hmm. So the river carves the land, but it's not necessarily, you know, in the natural sense of the word, affected by the land as much as the river that is carving through. So and do you mean affecting gave... people as well there? Like as in, as in they, they indirectly affect people as they move through life? Or is it more, what do you mean by land? So in, in a river, like the river cuts through the land, right? So as the river yeah, flows through, yeah. like very very gently though, mm. often very gently, it's, it's over time 
it yeah. cuts through. And someone gave an example, and I can't remember the epitaph of Marcus Rousseau that says that we should, you know, that our virtue should smell strong. So even if you didn't want to smell me, because I smell strong, you would anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I would make you notice me through my smell, through my smell, by just literally wandering through that path, taking mm. that path, because a sage would influence other people. If those people yeah. are searching actively for virtue, and I fundamentally believe that the person who wrote that comment is, is desperately searching for virtue, yeah. who really understands the importance of the environmental message, and is very deeply concerned that people could, you know, um, taint stories with a brush that is just mm. not adequate for them at all. And that is a concern of mine. I think environmentalism can be a very negative thing and becomes a series of virtue signaling. Right? Yeah. So we are in complete agreement. But if I don't frame that in a, the right way, mm. what I do is I brush past people instead of saying, look, you just saw me getting attacked on social media. Not particularly badly, but very personally. I mean, they yeah. were very polite, but it was very personal. Yeah. And then the response is, I don't know if you read my response yet, but the response of it was, wow, you weren't angry. You were not angry. Why were you not angry? Because I practiced stoicism. Mm. And so this individual, I actually very grateful to because they gave me the exact opportunity to prove, you know, to use a Christian thing, to practice what I preach. Yeah. How hypocritical of me would it have been to go in there and get cross? I mean, yeah. if I'd have done that, I'm sure as you know me relatively well, you'd say, that's not the guy that talks on my podcast. Yeah. That's not the guy that I want on the show because yeah. he's not living up to the standards that he's put himself. And they're not as high as the sage, believe me. I, yeah. You know, I'm sure I could have written it better. I'm sure there was a nicer way to, to say it. And I say nicer way in terms of a way that was more uh, coherent with the stoic message. I did my best. Yeah. So that was like how I said I would love to have a what would the sage do? Because I think that we should all have them. <laughs> like, yeah. Because you sit there and take a minute. The sage, do you remember that the sage would not necessarily have an opinion? Hmm. So that's the 24 hours like, I, don't, I can't have an opinion because if I have one, it will be a false one. Yeah. So the, it's like the sage will say, do I need to have an opinion? Yeah. I don't need to have one. I mean, that's really weird because, you know, being a podcast, like, podcast host, you hear people's opinion all the time. But I've just discussed mm. with you that one of the beautiful characteristics that I believe you have is the ability to play devil's advocate, the ability yeah. to be incredibly neutral. Now, I know in the past that you and I don't agree with certain things, but we've never made that an issue. And that is stoicism. To yeah. be able to put it to one side and say, you know what, Kai, I don't agree with everything you say. Well, good, because I'm not the sage, so please don't. And please correct me. <laughs> and please highlight me when you know uh, things are wrong. And you know, the other interesting thing is like, in my progress to be a sage, and we discussed this before, I, I took John Peterson as a really good example of this, which is people find, you know, people who know my work, how can you take some good quality from John Peterson? Well, why wouldn't I? Yeah. He taught me the, the art of saying, which I did say in my speech, I am very careful with my words. Yeah. I never said stoicism and environmentalism was saying, what I said was, if you believe that sustainability is fundamentally linked to courage, justice, self-control and wisdom, then being unsustainable is the antithesis of virtue. Therefore, being mm. sustainable is stuck. Yeah. Now, if you don't agree with my premise, which you can definitely disagree with, and there are people that do, that's fine. But that's not the same as environmentalism. And I only learned that through listening to John Pearson. So mm. even like in, in stoicism, we can listen to people that we would fundamentally disagree on a lot of things mm. and still see the really wise characteristic that that person has. And I think John Pearson yeah. is incredibly wise in that way. Mm. And that's something that I adopted. Yeah. I can hear half the Stoic community cheering for you and half of them uh, vomiting right now. <laughs> Which, yeah, exactly. I, I don't know. Exactly. I don't know why he's such a it's such a divisive figure. Everything that I've listened to, I just don't understand why he's so divisive. I can't see it. But um, but, you know, I think uh, I think you make a few really good points there. And and particularly with with, you know, not not having an opinion. I think that's a, that's a really interesting place to be as well as man like everybody has an opinion on absolutely every subject even subjects that they've never heard before 
And I'm I'm pretty sure I've seen videos before even where like they go around asking people, oh, what's your opinion on this person? And they don't, it's like a made up person. And these people are like, oh yeah, well, I think they're really cool. You know, like they're talking about a pop figure or something that doesn't exist, right? And people still have an opinion, <laughs> right? We have this <laughs> massive insecurity and I will not pretend to have even scratched the surface of fixing this within myself. But like, we have this massive insecurity that like, we have to have an opinion on everything. We have to uh, act as if our opinion is right on everything. Um, how do you, how do you get to that point where you can just sit like, and just, just, just not have that opinion? Cause that's a difficult thing for people to get to. Practice. Yeah. Okay, I, think brilliant. Trolls, I think every troll that has trolled me because I learned, and it's a kid, it's a kid's, I, I watched a kid's program in Portuguese to improve my Portuguese. Mm. It's called Ninjago, which is a Lego kid's program, right? It's like seven, mm. aimed at seven rods. And Master Wu, who's like the sensei of the, of the ninjas, he says, he asks the ninjas, how, you know, how is it best, how best do you neutralize an enemy, right? So this is not his wisdom, but this is how I learned it in Portuguese. How best do you neutralize an enemy? And they go through 23 minutes of fun, right? And it comes to make the enemy your friend. Mm. And that person today has to be my friend on Facebook, which is not true friendship, but it is a step. Mm. Now, if you had, had seen that message on Saturday and the 250, 250 comments, which are like three quarters sort of in, in my camp, if, if, if I have a camp, but I don't think uh -huh. I do, but they would call them to put themselves in my camp and record to that word. No one would know that he has you know, reflected. Them. And that's the beauty. Like I have thanked every troll and I continue to thank them for allowing me to point out one particular positive characteristic. And there is always one. Thank you very much for engaging with my work. Mm. Thank you for caring enough to comment. Yeah, they beautiful. might care in a very negative sense, but that is something I found that has allowed me to have no opinion because yeah. if I have an opinion towards that person, it's not going to be a good one. And therefore I can't navigate those waters. I, mm. I can't bring wisdom to them, and it's not necessarily my wisdom, it might be a quote, it may mm. be a reflection. So people would say to me yesterday, oh, well, you know, environmentalism, it, you know, I'm oh, sorry, it, the environment is beyond our control. It might be, but there are some aspects that are not. So mm. if you are aware that there's injustice going on, why would you not do anything? So let's take the, the bushfires. If you saw a fire and you have a bucket of water, oh, well, the environment's beyond my control. But you have mm. a bucket of water. Like, at least yeah. use that one bucket. It's only one bucket. It doesn't make a difference. What happens if a koala is sitting by that bush and that one bucket happens to allow the koala to escape? Yeah. Just makes the soil a little bit cooler for that koala to crawl across that ground. And you can pick that koala up and take it to the nearest center. You see, this is the thing. I'm not asking people to get the fire brigade out because, you know, oh, I'm not a fireman I can't, or a fire person. Mm. I can't do that. Yeah, but you have a bucket. Can you throw it on there? Yeah. Is, it, is that a wise thing to do? Yeah. So that was yeah. the kind of sort of things that I, I encourage people to do. So having no opinion is something I've learned to do. And it's come from having a no opinion on somebody. And this is like, uh, you know, it's, I think is it appetizer says, and don't say that somebody's bad, you know, say that they are, and then be very specific about what they are. So, okay, yeah. this troll is terrible. No, this troll, if not my word that would use, but this person is, is, is wrong about this. Yeah. They're wrong about this, and they're angry about this, and why are they angry? So mm. there was a debate yesterday. I tried to find out why this person, not the same person, why a different person was very annoyed with me. And they wouldn't tell me. Well, I try. I said, look, can we find a positive piece of ground to stand on? Because I don't know mm. what your opinion is and I can't understand why you're annoyed. Yeah. And they wouldn't give it to me. They kept repeating, like the kid that asked why, 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 yeah. like, this is not helping. At yeah. that point, it becomes sage-like, I would say, to withdraw and say, this person yeah. doesn't want to discuss. Yeah. So again, it's also learning when to withdraw and say, I could be on... You know, I could be on Facebook for the next 20 minutes begging a person to give me their reasons why they have an opinion, which I don't even know what it is because they won't tell me, just, yeah. just responding angrily. Well, that's their problem. It's not mine. And they might be a perfectly wonderful person. Like, mm. they just cannot communicate well in, like, 20 words. <laughs> yeah. So it's also like that. But it's only practice, and it's something that's been two and a half years in the making. Yeah. And, you know, reflecting on the conversations that you and I have had and how we've managed to stay, I would say, very uh, close as two Stoics uh, progressing in, in a journey together. Yeah, of course. I mean, certainly part yeah. Of the journey. 
Yeah, <laughs> and, and I just understand that, that I, I know absolutely it. nothing. So honestly, anything that you say will be of value to me. <laughs> like I, I know, I know, I know nothing about this, honestly. And and now that I'm jumping back into the podcast, it's it's great. I'm realizing how little I actually know. And it's such a good opportunity to really dig in and, and ask these questions of people like yourself who are who are probably doing the study that I need to be doing. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for everybody sharing that information with me. And that's what I'm trying to do, right? I'm trying to trying to reach out to the best people in the world who know about this and and see what they think. Um, and if OK, so I'm going to I'm going to recap quickly and then I have uh, some other questions about the sage because I want I want to make sure that everybody, you know, I People could get jump on here and they could just be new to stoicism and this is like the first thing that they hear and they're like, this yeah. is just all a bunch of, I don't know what's going on, right? But um, yeah, of course. what is a sage? Why is it important? Um, so, okay, so the sage is somebody who is uh, the most virtuous of people in the possible, uh, virtuous of people within the context of what we now know and within the context of a society to a certain extent. Um, they, they're also somebody who is... Uh, it's it's attainable in theory, not necessarily in practice. Uh, would be very difficult to attain in practice. Um, I also wanted to so there's there's a question that I have about Aristotle and how he might play a role in us understanding this better. Um, but it also sounds like going back to that discussion about the the Christian or the religious version of the sage versus uh, this kind of secular sage. It seems like it's also very, very similar to the way that Buddhists would look at, say, like a guru, like or or like a like a Buddha, right? It's like it's somebody yeah. who isn't necessarily, like you said, a god. They're not necessarily somebody who is completely like divine and out of this world. It's literally just somebody who has reached a higher level of consciousness, right? Like a higher level of understanding about. Um, I heard it put like this on a uh, on a post that Massimo Pigliucci wrote. I think he said um, they have a perfect understa understanding of nature and humans and and wisdom and the divine. Or no, it, it was like it was like a knowledge of divine and human nature, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So is it pretty similar to that kind of Buddhist idea of like the ideal? So I'm not an expert on Buddhism, so I'm not the person to ask. Okay, and I, cool. Again, cool. I have no opinion because I do not know. Yeah, I okay, do cool. not know. There are much yeah. better people. I would ask, for example, Gregory Lopez, who wrote with Massimo Pellucci. If yeah. I stated an opinion now, it would just mislead me. Okay, so that's cool. a good example. of. Let's of, practice that. Yeah. You know, I, know, I, I want to correct something. I wouldn't say that it's a secular necessarily. I would say it's philosophical, not religious. Because okay, cool. the sage... I, I, I like if, that, if, yeah. The sage is spiritual. There yeah. is a, their whole sort of being is to become at one with themselves mm. and the universe. And becoming yeah. one with themselves is understanding fundamentally more than you and I do at the moment mm. how, how they can really become wise in their social role. And their social role is dictated by the physical reality around them. So if mm. climate change is happening, which I strongly believe it is, and we have facts to prove it then their whole role is determined by that reality in mm. a way that maybe 2000 years ago or certainly before 1850 industrial revolution that is not the case so mm. you could say well how is it possible that the sage ignored the environmental pollution in, in the roman period which is actually as bad as it was in 1850 because mm. of the lead mining because they didn't have the scientific knowledge to understand what this contamination was doing can yeah. the sage plead the same case now no so he or she is saying, I want to be at one with the universe, the essence of the universe, the very sort of, I don't know, I, maybe the wrong term, but the vibrations, the sounds, the visuals of the universe. I want to be at one with that. I intricately mm. want to know what that means for me. Now, that yeah. doesn't mean I have to be all hippie and, 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 and sit in my Epicurean garden, right? I'm not sitting there saying, oh, well, I'm just having a nice life and having strong my guitar. No, the sage is active. They may not mm. be an activist, right? They could be a musician. Mm. They could be a musician in, in the case of, say, for example, U2 and have very... Hey, sort I'm of, feeling uh, a lot better about this because I play trumpet and I sing. Like, hey, I yeah, could... <laughs> yeah, they do well. Uh, but but they, they might have a, a fundamentally environmental or political message mm. or a social message or a message of why wisdom is important. So mm. one of my, uh, you know, mu I really like Muse, not in terms of their music, but the way they write lyrics. 
I mean, incredibly wise. And they mm. talk about unsustainability and the laws of thermodynamics in the, yeah. in the song, Unsustainable. And yeah. you say, like, they talk about entropy and how everything decays and gets destroyed and that we're accelerating those processes through the way that we're living. So you don't need to be an activist. In fact, I would say, again, unless you're a very, you know, highly strong and strong human being, maybe mm. that isn't the best for you. Maybe the best thing you can do is to play your trumpet. And when people say, why did you play it so beautifully? Because I feel at one with the universe when I'm playing that trumpet. I seek yeah. to play it wisely. I seek to play it well. I seek to play it ex with excellence. So Arate, the, the whole point of being a sage as well is to act excellently. What I mean mm. by that, a knife, that, the standard example is the knife that cuts well is excellent. Yeah. Although it was yeah. it was translated into view, which people wrongly attribute to only manliness. The original word in Greek was arity. It was not ascribed to just males and it was not ascribed even to just females. It was ascribed mm. to anything that was was seen as doing its duty well. So what is the yeah. duty of a knife? What is the purpose of a knife? To yeah. cut well. So if a knife fails to cut well, then it's not excellent. If a yeah. human being fails to live according to virtue, and that includes living according to their own nature and the nature of the universe, then they are no longer deemed mm. excellent. Yeah. So the, the sages, the sage, I honestly believe the sage has a spiritual path, but it is not necessarily what we would call, quote unquote, a religious one. Mm. But neither I would say is it's completely secular in the sense that they, they would say that they are the pinnacle, that's it. I, there's mm. nothing beyond you know this physical universe and myself. They say there is in the sense that there's an essence, like in terms of that, is it within the universe? So it's not supernatural, but it's beyond myself because the perfection in the stoic world, the highest rung of the ladder, so the lowest rung is actually rocks, mm -hmm. then plants, animals, then uh, sorry, non-human animals, then animals, uh, then humans, then the like the sage, and then the universe. So yeah. the universe because of being whole and being coherent yeah. and being the very thing that ties everything together and allows us to live eudaimonia, so allows us to live the good life about the mm. universe, how we do it, is, is that sort of sense. And I think that requires a spiritual understanding because if you take a, to, you know, take a scientific view, you say, of course it's good and of course we wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the universe because the universe doesn't exist, we don't exist. Yes, okay, but yeah. I think it's a, it's a slightly different conscious level. Now then you can say to me, and you're perfectly, it's perfectly great to say to me, well, that, that's, you know, hocus pocus, I don't want to go that far. Okay, you don't have to go that far. I'm just saying this mm. is where it comes from. And I just mentioned the other day that there's no heaven or hell. What happens is that as you become more virtuous in, in, in the traditional stoic sense, the soul, which is a physical thing, it's not a, it's not a supernatural thing. So the soul is physical. As you become more virtuous, your soul thickens. Yeah. Right? It becomes thicker. The tension that you the virtuous tension that's contained within you is thickened. And those with the thickest souls take the longest to burn at the end of the universe, which then, according to, again, very stoic tradition, the universe reincarnates itself. So not just mm. a particular animal, plant, or human being, but the entire universe sort of relives again. Mm. Which I guess if you even if you even understand parallel universes, you can say, well, it's kind of like a rebirth in that sense. That and so like that's what they say that the, 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 the sage has the thickest soul. And it takes the longest to burn through. Why? Because they are most, mm. they are able to really be at one with the universe. Yeah. Again, you can say that it's helpful or not helpful. I personally find that much more helpful than a heaven hell concept yeah. of being, oh my gosh, I'm living in yeah. fear of hell rather than like praying. For example, I, I, I use the example of I pray quite a lot in the sense of gratitude yeah. and humility and to be like, I am not the most important thing in the universe yeah. here. The most important thing is rationality. It's the very essence of what I would call God, or you can call mm -hmm. the Logos, or Zeus, or you can call just, you know, even you can say some stardust, like the very essence yeah. of, of everything that, 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 that we share. So for me, prayer is very important, although not necessarily in sort of like the, the archetypal Christian yeah. sense of the term. But I think to reflect and to meditate on my inability sometimes or often to not quite go as virtuous as I could go, to yeah. step back and, and, and almost marvel what is given to us, that I have no control over and yet I'm able to breathe. And I, that's, that's, you know, I didn't create that 
and yet I'm able to breathe. I didn't create the crops that grow in the ground or the soil that binds the crops together, and yet I'm able to eat. And I think that's my sort of spiritual mm. reflection. I'm not saying that that's necessarily what I sage would do. That's my view on the sage. So before you get a load of hate now, that's my <laughs> personal view. That's how I've that's how I've put the uh, proverbial square peg in the round hole because it is quite a square peg and you have to you know, fiddle with it a bit. Um, but I still think that the beauty of it is that those people that are particular uh, agnostic or atheistic can appreciate that it's a yardstick only, that mm. it's an ideal. And those with a more spiritual inclination, uh, certainly like myself, would be able to say, yes, it's actually there's another level here. Mm. And how far you dig is up, is up to you. Like, again, if it, you can't force yourself to believe in something, right? So I would say yeah. if it's against your nature to have a spirit, you know, to see it as a spiritual path, then why force yourself down that road? Mm. You can't yeah. force yourself to believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. You either believe it or you don't believe it. Mm. Like, you, you can't, I want to believe it. Well, it's not the same as actually believing it. So instead of saying, oh, instead of atheists telling spiritual people, you know, you cannot believe that, or me telling it, atheistic well don't you think there's another layer here yeah. it really depends on how you view that according to your role again according to your personal nature so i think in stoicism there's absolutely room for spirit spiritual path i think yeah. there's even room for christianity if we take maybe some of the more uh, interesting interpretations of christianity i certainly think you can there are there is scope there is a limited scope i would argue but there is some scope for having both paths and mm. who am I to tell you to leave your religion of childhood? That's mm. up to you. Yeah. To me, the most important thing is, are you acting virtually? Are you taking care of the earth? Mm. If you believe that God made it in seven days or that it's made over 4.5 GA, really irrelevant to me as a person. I would then argue, seek wisdom and you will find the answer. I don't need to tell you, you and I don't need to tell people what the answer is because if you really seek, then I think it personally becomes obvious what the answer is without you and I having mm. to say what that is. Yeah. But telling people that they're wrong and having an opinion on their religious path is absolutely not the way to go. I, I think yeah. it actually turns people off. And I've been able to have much more interesting conversations with people. When I was like, look, do you want to be Christian? <laughs> go ahead, be Christian. But be yeah. virtuous in yeah. that. Yeah. And, and seek seek environmental facts seek scientific facts mm. and seek those facts that science cannot unpack because the, the, not all facts are quantitative yeah. and that's my major issue with science as an engineer right that we seem to uh, why is stem so important because we emphasize the need to measure everything mm. but how can you measure the beauty of not having an opinion how can you measure that as a mm. as an important fact in how you navigate the world right mm. how can you do it you can't so I think we have space for qualitative knowledge, so the quality of knowledge that we have, and the ability to measure. So yes, I do think it's important to know how the universe works from a quantitative sense, but I also think there is some beauty in the added layer of a qualitative layer, and that that may be spiritual and it may not. Hmm. Because if we emphasize too much the scientific fact, right, I'm still saying we, the foundation should be a scientific fact, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that we should be yeah. esoteric, in the sense of we should be completely spiritual and not be tied to fact, no, because that's, that's again, not being tied to the physical reality. That's just yeah. anti-sage-like. You need to be tied to your physical reality. But also to be able to be open to the possibility that there are things that you really don't understand and there is a connection that binds us all together that we fundamentally, even as scientists, don't understand. I think there is beauty for the humility. Mm. And I do think the sage is very humble being and Chrysippus uses that as an argument for God, actually, for the state of God, of if you do not believe in anything higher than yourself, like the God of the, you know, the God that we've been discussing, mm. then you are very arrogant. And mm. arrogant is not. Insane. And you're essentially playing God, right? You're like, okay, well, I am all powerful. I am all knowing uh, to the point where I can even say that there is nothing higher than me. And this is this is a really interesting discussion to have. And I might even take it a little bit further than you. And I might be the one to. Uh, uh, to to take the take the load here of um of of uh, I don't know trolling whatever you call it, but you know I I have when we talk about this aligning with nature you know I have on, only recently really started to uh, well I feel as though I'm starting to understand it, and and 
it seems like there is something ex- okay so firstly that's like the ultimate goal of stoicism right so it needs to be taken very seriously like it needs to be taken extremely seriously if you're like if you if you're trying to use stoicism in your life effectively right um like sure right. you can just you can just be a half stoic that's fine like, or you can just you know you take and use some of the principles that's fine i i and i encourage people to do that because i don't think you should go like whole hog on anything but this idea of aligning with nature uh it seems like there is a place for having a deep understanding that this process of nature that's running the show you're not running the show like the process of nature is running the show and if the process of nature is running the show just by virtue of the fact that it is running the show means that it's on a higher level than you that you are essentially being tugged around to and fro and i mean uh, that's that's in some ways what the um, ancient like that's why they had many gods back in the days in the ancient Rome and ancient mm. Greece right it's like because we were being right. like puppets being tugged through to and fro by nature, mm. um, and and so when you think about that it's like um, you can't really deny that we as human beings are not separate from nature but we are actually one hundred percent in a part like we are we are nature we are a part of it. And we mm. are being actively used by it, um, not used in the sense that it's a god, because you don't have to believe in a god to believe that nature That's is right. much higher than right. you in terms of intelligence. And <laughs> you're like, like, yeah, and, of course, yeah. And 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 so if you look at it, you and you think, okay, maybe I'm not running the show. Then you get into a really interesting place where uh, you can see a lot of connections between ancient Stoicism and say like. Taoism or Buddhism that says that, yeah, you're not running the show, right? So you need to dig a little bit deeper and understand that you're not running the show. And this comes down into even to the idea of Christian, the Christians teach of grace, right? It's like, you will never be perfect. You will never get to a point where you are like godlike, but through grace, which is essentially like that point where you get to where you realize that you can't achieve everything, that you can't be everything that you could possibly be. You can't be that ideal, but you would like to be. And so you have to let go, right? That's that's kind of the the idea in some of Taylor's. And it's like, you have to get to that point where you let go and say, I can't do this. So I'm going to let my biological nature part of me take over that simply knows the direction I probably should go, right? And when you can let go in that level and stop playing God and stop believing that you have all the answers, then you reach a point in your mind where nature can take over in some way because you, just like a lion, have natural inbuilt compasses that can kind of guide you through. And and they're always guiding us, whether we know it or not. But do you see where I'm going? It's like there I think needs I needed that be... soundbite on Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> I but needed that I, I th- I think, on Saturday. I think what I'm trying to say is there needs to be an profound. extreme humanity. Uh, sorry, uh, extreme humility that says I'm not running the show, but I am to a certain degree. But but I need to, in some ways, let go and realize that this process of nature is far bigger than me, far older than I am. Uh, it will live longer than I am uh, and going to live. And maybe it knows a little bit better about where I should go. Right. And so that's why we have tendencies. That's why you're born. And Hey, like me, I never practice my instruments or my music and I know I should. And the reason I should is because naturally I have an ability as a musician. I have naturally have that, had that talent my whole life. And I know for a fact that if I practice 12 hours a day, I would outperform anyone who didn't start with that natural ability just because I started with it. Right. So it's like, what is that? What is that natural ability that I have that somebody else doesn't have? What is it about you that makes you extremely interested in sustainability and nature and, and philosophy and, uh, and, and all this stuff. It's so strange to me. And, and I've been really thinking about this lately. What does it mean to align with nature? I really, I don't know if, you can look at stoicism fully and completely understand it without saying, I need to let go of a lot and let go of a lot of control. Do you know what I mean? I think that's the most profound thing I've heard somebody say for this 
last month. It was absolutely, I couldn't. I, I will. I will play this back. I will write this down. This is going into a text <laughs> like, because absolutely. I mean, I would say maybe that you didn't. I would just make one caveat that maybe it wasn't natural ability, but certainly natural inclination. That, that's because it. ability yeah. is something. Yeah, ability is something that we craft. Yeah, but definitely. the inclination, I think, is that tendency that you're talking about. So we have an inclination to look after each other, yeah. theosis in, in stoicism. But the ability is something because you responded to your role because the inclination that you crafted the ability. Yeah. So I, I don't think anybody's born with it, well, with a natural ability, but certainly a natural inclination, and the awareness to craft that inclination into an ability is when you are living according to nature. Mm. So it's not surprising, therefore, that you do a podcast, still audio, right? Yeah. So it's not music, but it's still audio. And I just told you, like, that's something that that I, it's not that I couldn't play an instrument. Mm. I just don't believe that I'm <clears throat> particularly good at it. And I would work extremely hard. And I would, you know, outperform those that didn't have that natural inclination mm. or that, that became an ability or merged into one. And it would be very hard for me to shine on the on the global scale because mm. I just think that once you get to the one percent, like you have to have that inclination or that interest that I may have forged in myself. But again, if I didn't enjoy it as much as someone who just says, you know what, if I do not play my trumpet, I cannot breathe. Like if I don't yeah. write something about like social matters that I feel like what on earth am I doing? Like yeah. and I don't get paid rather. I'm an engineer, so I don't get paid to write philosophical things other than the book, which was a nice surprise. But like most of the time I'm I'm doing calculations and thinking about engineering. But to mm. me, like the engineering gave me the quantitative, the everything else gave me the qualitative. So I think you're absolutely right. It's about letting go. And I mm. believe that Sage would be able to let go and say, as you as you rightly said, it's something bigger than me. All I have is a role. Yeah. I have a role on the stage of life. Am yeah. I playing it to the best of my ability? Yeah. And, and therefore, and, everything else is beyond my control. But what's in my role? What's in my script? What's yeah. plays in my hands? Yeah. is very much in my control. And and seriously, like I, I really think that there's something to that idea of like moving towards the things that you're inclined to be interested in, right? Like, because when do you learn the best? It's when you're learning something that you naturally are drawn to, right? Because that's going to carry you through the times when it's freaking annoying, right? Like, yeah, you're not. You're, <laughs> most of the time, most it, of the time. It's most of the time. <laughs> you know, this this might actually be a good place to to kind of come to my final question, which and I don't know we've been speaking for a while. This is awesome. This is going to be a, a, like a, there's so much value that you've added here in this in this whole podcast. I really appreciate it and. I had one more question and it was to do with, with virtue because obviously the sage is virtuous. We need to understand what that is. And in a way, it also kind of ties into some of what I've been saying here and what, what you've been saying as well. And it goes back to Aristotle. I'll be the first to admit, I, I don't know the first thing about a lot of what Aristotle said and I need to know. Like, And, and that's why, you know, I'm... I really need to read everything that is available on Aristotle and also need to talk to some experts on the show. So um, if you know anyone or if you yourself are like an absolute expert on Sto uh, on Aristotle, I need them on the show. Um, but I did listen to a lecture where they were talking about his view of, of, of virtue. And they were saying, uh, I'll have to post the interview, sorry, the, the lecture in, in the show notes, but it was brilliant. They're saying that he, he essentially taught that virtue has to be the right thing in the right state of mind. So it's like, you don't apologize to someone just because they're angry at you and you're gonna get hurt if you don't apologize. You apologize to them because it's the only thing to do. Like it's the right thing to do, right? And so everything has to be right action, but also right state of mind. Like not making a decision just because it's gonna harm you if you don't do that, right? Like. And so exactly. ha how do you get to that point? And I'm guessing that would be very much because the Stoics were influenced by, by Aristotle, obviously. Uh, how do you get to that point where you can be, uh, where, where you can constantly practice like being in the right state of mind whilst also making the right choice? Like that seems like an almost unattainable thing in mm -hmm. our lifetime, at least. I try to do it in like the sort of the meditation that I do because I am aware that when I put in other variables, so into the logarithm that you know, so the algorithm that is life, that gets messed up. But I, I think in 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 your quiet space, you can you can do that. 
So let me take the example of uh, prayer. I actually use the practice of the five prayers of Islam because you're yeah. called by nature to pray. So I got up this morning before the sunset and my last prayer will be uh, after, substantially after sunrise. And I, I, I really like the fact that nature calls me. Mm. Right? Nature yeah. calls me. I don't decide to pray because it's convenient. It is not necessarily a convenience. Yeah. And I just, I just decided that every time I pray, I have the opportunity to think about, you know, my maker, to use a very religious sense, or I would say the Logos, but let's yeah. keep it so that people, I can stand in, so God can stand, I use that in a metaphorical sense, God stands in front, in Israel actually God stands in front of you when you are praying. So every time I would pray, or I pray later today, I feel like the opportunity to thank the universe, the Logos, the, the real essence. I don't do it out of fear anymore. So, yeah. you know, when I had more religious what I would call more religious tendencies, it was a fear of going to the wrong place, right? A few years ago, but let's... So now I feel and that I am able to do those five prayers, which can be highly inconvenient, especially in public, by the way, uh, because I, I recognize that it's not out of fear anymore. So mm. I'm doing the right thing in terms of meditating on virtue, every, you know, mm. by at least one of the day, meditating on how I can be virtuous, meditating how I can align myself, the, the very words that I use, and, you know, a little pray for, how can I, how can I do that? How can I sit there and, and process that, and for the right reasons? Mm. So the wrong reason would be, I have, because my parents told me, childlike uh, understanding, of, I, I, I just didn't, I just didn't eat the, the ice cream because my mum told me not to. <laughs> it's a silly example, but that's what we do so many times. Oh, I, you know, I, I apologize to him because somebody asked me to. Hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I, that's the space that I've created because you are right. I couldn't do it. I couldn't. I couldn't practice that in the real world. It was just mm. too hard. So I decided that the best way to practice is like when you play your trumpet, you play at home, right? And it's only when you're ready that you then go out. I'm assuming I've never done it myself, but I'm assuming that you go out at a certain point once you're ready. And you play in front of the public. You perform. You mm. literally perform. So I felt that if I could take the five prayers, which are not dictated by me, so I took out my I am God, I'm God, I therefore I should decide when it's convenient to me, took that out. It's completely aligned with nature. So I will also do Ramadan, the fasting, of, mm. which is in like April to May, which is long days. Yeah. Maybe not in Australia, but like long days here. Why? Because again, it's tied, tied, tied to nature. And practice doing the right thing for the right reasons in my personal space. Does that mean that everyone should do that? No, I just had to find a way. I didn't know another way to do it. Mm. Of finding that space to being called on command almost. For me personally, that really works. Some people probably yeah. doesn't. Yeah. And to reflect on why am I doing this and what is the right thing? Because I couldn't do it. It was just too many variables. And, you know, in the sense of like, I felt that I wasn't strong enough to do it yeah. without practicing it. So as I've done this and it's... God, I've gone back to this practice now since the beginning of the year. Like I have you know, been very committed to praying on the select times. Like that has shown me some discipline I didn't think I had. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't even aware that I had it. Yeah. Oh my gosh, it's really inconvenient. I'm in, I'm in a shopping center. I don't care what people think. Do I care? Indifferent. So I'm sitting there, I'm rolling out, you know, I'm rolling out, you know, my coat, yeah. praying in a shopping yeah. center. Now people go, people wouldn't see that as a stoic practice at all, but it was like, do I care what people think? No, I do not care what people <laughs> think. <laughs> so, like, yeah. so it was just a way for me personally to do that. Again, it's yeah. a very uh, unorthodox, very strange way to do it, but it personally, it worked for me. Um, yeah. So it was, I just couldn't do it in any other way. I couldn't practice in an argument. I did was able to do a little bit on Saturday, but then I wasn't in, I wasn't physically there. Yeah. And so how else, you know, how do I learn to strengthen my muscle? Yeah. I have to do it in my quiet space and I'm hoping haven't got any evidence really that outside of social, you know, that barrier that social media provides, I can then take that practice of calm, discipline, not caring what people think, and put it into a more, um, a more useful, quote unquote, useful in terms of the social sense. You know, use it as a mechanism for for sort of social good, and to yeah. demonstrate stoicism in a much more um, collective and communal yeah. way. Yeah. But I had to withdraw. I had to withdraw it into myself and work that out. So it might take me years. I don't know. But that's something I did because I tried other forms of meditation. I just got distracted all the time. I just yeah. couldn't do it. It was like, oh, I won't do it because it's really inconvenient right now. Oh, I'll do it later. I was always later, 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 later. Mm. So with the thing with the Islamic form of prayer, there's no later. Like you do it yeah. at other times or you don't do it. So I think that's it brilliant. was like that. Yeah. I think that's a really, like, that's a, 
a be- like for me because I am just I'm so like I'm so uh, like that I know that the reason why I have those certain opinions about the alignment with nature is because I tend to be very interested in nature. I love climbing mountains, you know, I love being outside, trail running. It's just my favorite thing to do. So when I hear you say that it's like it, it, you're called by nature to do it, like I just think that that's like a beautiful thing. It's, 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 and it seems to be aligned with nature as well. But, it, but I guess what you're getting at is have some sort of meditation practice where you can really stop and think about the, the way that you're living your life, the way that you're acting, and whether it truly yeah. is in alignment with what is virtue or whether you're just being a stubborn jackass all the time. You know, like so, <laughs> yeah. And, and, yeah. <laughs> So I asked people for feedback, uh, friends uh, who felt it was strange that I was say praying in a in a, in a shopping center in that in that form, and mm-hmm. they said, "Why do you, you know in Islam? Why you know why that? It's because you use your body. It's a very physical way of praying. You're not you know, if anybody knows yeah. what most people I would say know how that works. It's not a put my hands together. It's like getting down, putting your head on the floor, right? Yeah. So it's a very physical thing. So it's showing reverence, I would say, to to for me the logos through a physical act. So yeah. I'm tying my my physical body to this essence of nature, which is also physical, by the way, but mm-hmm. in a very sort of rhythmical movement. And again, I'm not saying that that is stoic. I wouldn't say that it, it necessarily is. It just happens to work for me, and I use yeah. it as part of my stoic practice. And I'm sure people think that's really weird. Why would you do that? Okay, but that's just the way that it really works for me. And yeah. people said I've become calmer. I've become more reflective. Why? I would say because it's no longer about me anymore. Like I just, how can I make this not about me? How can I make it not? Oh, my convenience. What I think is good. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's just follow a, a physical practice. You know, this prayer bit and, and see what happens. And it's just amazing that this call call. So yeah, I use the Adam, but I could use anything else. Just it's easy because it's an app, so it tells me. So okay, okay, right. I've got the next two hours. I'm gonna gonna make time for it. Oh, is that fair? And they're like, yeah, but if you're not going to go to hell, why are you doing? That's the complete wrong reason to do it. I'm doing it because I'm grateful. Yeah. I'm doing it out of human. I'm doing it out of humility. It doesn't sound so humble talking about it, but you know, it's the first time I've ever talked about. It. I've never spoke to anybody about this. Yeah. Um, you know, outside my very close circle. Because I, I, I'm offering that because that's something I find helpful. So I'm, I'm not ashamed of it. People say, oh, it's a really religious practice. But I don't use it for religious reasons. Mm, yeah. now, I'm not religious about it in, in the same way that other people would sort of align that kind of practice. So it's just something that I had to do. I had to know myself. Can I do this? Can I keep this yeah. up? Can I? It's something important to me. So people say that, yeah, I was calmer, I reflected more. I was, people said I was less prone to anger, which I found really weird, which is great. Like, mm. that's amazing. They said, you just, you just took a second more to get angry. Mm. A second. And then you that's answer amazing. by saying, but, what are you saying? I'm always angry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> I think the thing is that when you're very sort of, uh, you get very passionate because I found this out when I was in the gym and somebody asked me an environmental question and they're like, I'm just asking you a question because the tone they thought I was getting angry, but I was being passionate, which is not necessarily helpful. And yeah. then because they thought I was being angry, I did feel angry. Because yeah, yeah. like, why are you being angry? I'm like, I'm not angry. <laughs> so Classic scenario. Me, you just took a, yeah, exactly. And you just took an extra second to get annoyed. You just yeah. took an extra second to get frustrated. You just took an extra second to be like, do I need to be as passionate about this? Yeah. In this context, what are they actually asking me? And why was that? Again, I think it was because forcing myself to take the moment, which is really inconvenient, because I'd much rather be angrier quicker, right? Like yeah. naturally, be like, Ugh. so it was just like, how can I inconvenience myself in such a way that causes me to stop, yeah. stop being kai for a minute, and try to be at one? Which again is, a, is Islamic, uh, certainly Sufi practice of being one with one with the universe and understanding the essence of nature. So I think that answers your question in a really convoluted yeah. way, but hopefully somebody found that at least interesting, particularly if they have a, a more religious tendency than say I do. Yeah. No, I, I, what, what I really like about it is it's it's essentially, you know, people have this fear of going outside of the sphere of their current uh, ideology or their current philosophy that they you know are appealed to um and and what i what i've been really interested in lately and what i'm what i really think is cool about what you're doing it's 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 taking the best from everywhere you know it's like taking a brilliant habit 
that uh that you know you can find in in islam you know and and you bring it into your life and and you say cool this could be really valuable for me as well and then you go over here and you say all these habits from the stoics are brilliant and then you go over here and you say you know well you know there, there's a buddhist practice that's really like i really like the idea of picking and choosing from different different uh you know uh, techniques different philosophies different religions and saying you know, traditions traditions yeah there's there's beautiful traditions yeah. within every single philosophy within every single religion within every every single culture um and in a way that's um like that that's a, that's a super beautiful thing and so i think it's like really cool anytime i hear somebody who is uh, going outside of stoicism to get something and bring it in as a practice that enhances their stoicism like yeah that's awesome and um you know i think this is like a really good place to kind of you know wrap up the conversation i like i know that we've talked a lot about the sage and hopefully people are a little bit clearer on what the sage is and and how it's helpful um but uh and i know we talked about a lot of other things but man like i love talking to you anytime so um come back on the podcast literally as much as you want and we'll always have a good conversation Thanks. Thank you. I just, yeah, just, just one call to the listeners. If you found something about, I'm open on the Facebook um, um, groups. You can even email me. Like, just keep it, you know, kind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm very ha happy to answer some very intricate. The, you know, the the, the 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 bigger, you know, bigger the spade, the more the more gravel you move. And the sage is a very big topic. But yeah. if you found this interesting, particularly if you are more spiritually or religious inclined, or even if you're agnostic and atheist, but you actually realize something that maybe I don't need to be so harsh with other people, mm. uh, I think that would be really great to hear because it's always wonderful to hear what the impact was. I certainly found a lot of solace just now sharing experience that I have not shared publicly. Mm. But that's what trust brings. That's what relationship that Simon and I have. And that's why I think fundamentally, most important thing, whether you, you think the sage is important or not, is to really value your practice and how and how your practice uh, reaches others. Be that river that carves the land gently. Don't mm. need to wind people up and just flow. Allow yourself to flow and not necessarily have an opinion about exactly how you flow. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, no, I appreciate you saying that. And and yeah, seriously, everybody, reach out to to either one of us if you've got any feedback from the episode or want have any questions or anything. Um, and definitely go to Kai first because I can guarantee that you're going to be uh, responding with some some crazy long emails and in depth <laughs> thoughts. <laughs> Typically, yes. Yeah. I love it. Well, thanks Thank so much, Kai. I appreciate you being here. Thank you very much. All right, so there you have it, my interview with Kai Whiting. Now, I'm sure you guys love that as much as I loved having that conversation, so make sure you head to the links in the show notes and uh, keep up to date with Kai. He'll definitely be back on the show many more times, and we're definitely going to have him back once he's released his book as well. Very exciting stuff. But uh, without any further ado, I hope that you enjoyed this episode, and I'll talk to you guys next time. But until then, I hope that this episode has helped you on your rise to the good life. Ciao. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Practical Stoic Podcast. If you'd like to stay up to date with the Practical Stoic community and everything to do with this podcast, then just go to my website, simonjedrew.com and subscribe to the Practical Stoic Weekly, a newsletter that I send out every week with updates and all sorts of great Stoic insights. You can also find me everywhere online by searching Simon J.E. Drew. See you next time.